we're extremely pleased, especially pleased to welcome two of our faculty, um, Kathleen Bergen, who is Associate Research Scientist uh, on Environment and uh, Sustainability, and Joshua Newell, Associate Professor of Environment and Sustainability at U of M. So they crossed the long walk, long walk from the building across here. Um, and they're giving a lecture on landscapes and logging in the Russian Far East. So I will say a few words about each of them. Um, Kathleen Bergen works in the areas of land cover, land use uh, change, and human dimensions of environmental change. She uses remote sensing, geographic information systems, what we call GIS, and geospatial methods to study the drivers and consequences of forest and other land changes. Uh, she's worked since 2000 on NASA-supported projects using remote sensing, remote sensing to quantify forests and land change in Siberia and the Russian Far East in the context of changing social uh, economic uh, eras. She's lead author of the chapter Human Dimensions of Environmental Change in uh, Siberia, uh, as well as a contributor to the International NASA Northern Eurasia Partnerships Initiatives Science Plans. Uh, Joshua Newell is associate professor, as I said, in the School of Environment and Sustainability here at U of M. He's a, a broadly trained human environment geographer whose research focuses on questions related to sustainability, resource consumption, and environmental and social justice. He's, rec he's a recognized authority on environmental and resource use um, in the Russian Federation, and especially the Russian Far East. Uh, he's published work um, uh, in this area, um, in Eurasian geography and uh, economics, and in the International Forestry Review, among many others. And he's also published two reference texts on environment and development in Russia's Far East. Um, and this year, we have the WCEE, the Wiser Center for Europe and Eurasia, uh, the centers for within WCEE, uh, have a, a special lecture series on the environment, and we're very pleased to have two experts on the environment who know Russia very well to speak about uh, issues related to the uh, to environment um, today. So please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Newell and Bergen. So are you my mic now? Perfect. Okay. So we have, uh, there's two of us speaking today, as you can gather. So what we're going to do is I'm going to speak for the first what, 15 or 20 minutes or so. And then Kathleen has a little bit longer of a presentation. And then at the end, we will come back and sort of reflect on the two pieces, if you will, and, and have time for questions and answers. Um, so I. Um, I first got in, let me give you a bit of background about myself and my involvement in Russia. So I started working in Russia in 1993. I was working uh, for an environmental advocacy organization in Japan, of all places, in um, Tokyo, uh, a group called Friends of the Earth, which has offices all over the world now, um, and sort of fell into Russia by mistake as a, or by accident, as is probably the case with lots of us, and became quickly fascinated with the place. But Basically, a funder came through and said, um, we're concerned about, it was right after the fall of the Soviet Union, we're concerned about the privatization of Russian forests. Does anyone in your office have any expertise? And I, I said, I don't have any expertise, but I'm 23 and uh, wanting, willing and able to move to Russia and start a research project with um, you know, Russian, future Russian colleagues. So I, I moved to Vladivostok in 1994. And I worked for off and on for about eight years in the NGO movement, uh, partially channeling money in to support the civil society in Russia, um, and then increasingly uh, with a focus on forest uh, trade, forest conservation, and in, in the vast Far East, which is Russia. Um, sorry, this is an image of the Far East from space. It's a tiled, I think it's a NASA composite tile. But what is amazing about this portion of Russia it, are, are many fold, one of which is that it is one of the, uh, has the lowest population densities on the planet. So you have about 7 million people in the Russian Federation, or Russian Far East. It's uh, roughly two thirds the size of the continental United States to give you a sense of scale. 
And I love this nighttime image of um, Northeast Asia or Eurasia. And you can see, if I put a pointer here, you can see the vast expanse that has very little light, right? So when we think about that, what I think about as somewhat interested in the natural environment is the amazing amount of wilderness that Russia has left, um, and particularly in Siberia and the Far East, because there isn't a lot of infrastructure still. Um, there are amazing tracts of roadless forest still. There's Kamchatka, there's the Bikin River, there's 20% of the world's fresh water in Lake Baikal, which is eastern Siberia. So it's an incredible place from a kind of natural environment point of view. And that often is a tale that doesn't get told, especially with the, um, the tales of the sort of the post-Soviet era and, and, and the wastefulness of the Soviet era in particular and all the wanton pollution and all of that's true, but there is another story uh, to Russia, another fabulous story of the wilderness of, of, of the Russian Federation, uh, especially the Far East. These are the frontier forests of Russia. These are large intact um, parcels of frontier of forest as defined, this is on animation for some reason, um, as defined by Global Forest Watch, which did a comprehensive mapping of, of old growth, if you will, uh, of the Russian Federation. You can see its spatial extent here. And Kathleen is actually going to be presenting a very, a synthesis of land cover land use change as it relates to forest and forest change uh, in this region, which also will include Eastern Siberia. But you can see the extent of the forest in this area. I am particularly interested in, and in fact wrote my dissertation uh, on the forests of the Sikotalin nature uh, area here, which is highlighted in this box. And my dissertation focused on tracking flows of wood into China and then into to, uh, U.S. retail outlets um, in, in, in the U.S. primarily. Um, so this is sort of just some basic background um, of, of, of the Russian uh, Far East. Um, in general, or as a whole, Russia has approximately 50% of the world's boreal forests or northern forests, um, a huge carbon sink, right? Um, it's an immense economic resource, resource. It's an immense resource for humanity. It's an immense resource for climate change or important area for climate change and for biological diversity and people. Um, and what's happening and why I became so interested in this region, especially in the post-Soviet era, was the gradual reorientation of sort of the economic structures of the Russian Far East from a sort of a resource base for European Russia and other parts of the Soviet Union towards Northeast Asia, and especially Japan, and increasingly in China. And this graph here just shows the rise of exports of wood to China. Um, China basically enacted a forest uh, protection plan that prote ended up protecting a lot of their domestic forests. They, um, then that led to a boom in exports, especially from, from Russia to China. You can see this really rapid increase uh, of um, of timber exports. And so what we see is really a whole reorientation of the timber industry from a, very much a European orientation towards an Asian and international trade sort of orientation. That has all sorts of implications for infrastructure, where roads go in, that has implications for people who depend on these forests for their livelihoods, that has implications for the types of logging that takes place. A lot of it to date is still basically logging the timber and exporting the raw logs. So not a lot of value-added processing, which has implications for the economy of the region and the stability of the region. Um, so very much a, a dramatic shift. You had a privatization of industry in the post-Soviet era, emergence of lots of small actors, which led to, has led to the rise of illegal logging and illegal export. Uh, very much a fragmented industry that's much harder to control on the landscape. And that has all sorts of uh, environmental and sustainability implications. Um, and what I've done, so I basically work a lot more in the urban sustainability space now, but I still have a piece of my heart and my scholarship that focuses still on the Russian Far East. And the way I've done it is sort of to extend some of the work that I did in my initial dissertation research, uh, which was way back in 2008 when I received my doctorate. But I'm still continuing to track resource flows out of Russia, specifically um, uh, wood flows, 
and I'm still linking them using a variety of data sets, customs data sets, trade data sets, uh, through China into uh, places like Walmart and IKEA and so on and so forth. And that enables me to ask questions about transparency of supply, the sustainability of this supply. Uh, it's very much a global wood. So even though we think about Russia as being remote, in fact, we're tied into Russia through the things that we consume. Um, a lot of the oak flooring that you might see at lumber liquidators uh, actually comes from Russia. Uh, and there's a lot of attendant problems with that sourcing. Um, this just shows a, a, a graph of sort of the evolution of the timber industry uh, since 1946 in all parts of the Russian Federation. Um, and you can see sort of the evolution. And what you've seen is a decline in production volumes, at least until very recently, um, but then a, an export, a, a very rapid export in, in the production to places like China and elsewhere. And that's coming back up a little bit here. You can see they used to produce a lot more wood during the Soviet era. So the environmental problems have shifted. I wouldn't say they're less severe than they were during the Soviet Union, although there's less production. It's very much more opportunistic a logging for export market, which has all sorts of um, localized impacts and pressures. Uh, this is the graph I showed you about China and export of Russian wood. Um, this is the region that I've been focusing on ever since, uh, actually, I moved to Vladivostok in 1996. Uh, and what we've seen here is very much an increasing pressure on these forests. And that's largely because of their proximity to China and to Japan. So they really have become a hot spot for resource extraction and unsustainable logging. Um, this is also an area that has probably the highest biological diversity anywhere in the Russian Federation. Um, and this is the land where the Siberian tiger uh, lives. Um, there's a lot of indigenous uh, communities still that uh, live in these forests. Um, so very high, high uh, value forests that also are the major source for oak and ash, um, which are some of the primary hardwoods that come out of this area. This is just to give you a picture of one of the biggest or the biggest uh, sort of forest region uh, here in the Russia, in the Primorsky uh, Sikotelin region. It's, um, this is not good. It's on, um, it's a, a wild, it's a roadless um, river basin. So it's about the size of Switzerland. There's virtually no roads. So you can you just get a picture of the scale. Um, but very much a region under harvest, especially for uh, oak and ash, which are the primary, as I mentioned, the primary hardwoods for flooring and some forms of furniture. So these are really the species in demand. Um, so what we did is we use a variety of customs and trade data sets and timber concession data sets to link the Russian uh, harvesters and exporters to the Chinese manufacturers to the US importers, and then finally to the retailers. So we're basically combining um, these trade data sets and timber concession data sets to actually source the locations of where this stuff is going, uh, especially focusing, in this case, on Walmart and Lowe's. And then publishing that information and sharing that, and then uh, drawing sort of um, awareness and an understanding of sort of the impacts of the resource extraction, the timber extraction, and, and then asking questions to these retailers, what is the responsibility in terms of sustainable sourcing? And just reminding people, I think we all realize we're in a globalized world, but reminding people of the linkages that we have to other seemingly distant places like the Russian Federation. Um, as an aside, I'm also doing this work on a variety of other uh, resources, including oil palm now with students in Guatemala, also um, avocados sourced out of Mexico. So we're using very similar kind of trade flow approaches that I sort of cut my teeth on when I wrote my dissertation and I have continued to refine. And we're doing that for a, a variety of commodities across, across the planet to try to bring an understanding of the impacts of consumption on these distant places and spaces, including the Russian Far East. So just a brief overview. I'm going to hand it off to Kathleen, um, who's going to present some work that's just about finished, actually. It's exciting work. And then I have one slide at the end where 
hopefully that will stimulate some, some conversation and some questions. Okay, um, good afternoon um, everyone and thank you uh, to Josh for that um, very interesting uh, introduction and overview um, about natural resources, especially forest resources in the Russian Far East. Um, I'm going to give it just a real brief, how did I get into all this um, um, as well. Like, like Josh, right out of um, getting my, uh, my PhD, um, I was working um, for an organization that had some uh, NASA funding and got involved um, with the very first NASA-funded research project um, in um, uh, Siberia, or actually in, in Russia, to look at land use, land cover change. And um, one of the people I was uh, working with is uh, Hank Shugart, who is a big name in um, the Russian boreal forest um, ecology. And if I recall, he was also the first American to be um, named to the Russian Academy of Sciences as well. So um, I got onto a project and have been working in the uh, area ever since. I've had a chance to uh, visit Russia uh, si Siberia uh, and Russia a number of times. So um, I'm going to take a little bit um, different tack here. I'm going to delve into a specific research project and introduce you a little bit to some of the kind of approaches and methodologies that we, um, that we take um, in looking at land use, land cover, uh, land cover change um, um, that's a little bit different from some of the sort of supply chain work that um, Josh has done. And Josh is um, obviously involved in this project as well. Um, so i be talking about how um, human and natural f factors influence forests and landscapes of the Russian Far East. So if the uh, landscapes, the forested landscapes are changing, what are the um, factors that are actually driving that change? And can we, can we quantify them? And can we map, map them? Um, so um, also, um, a little, bit, a little bit of history. Um, the uh, first projects that um, I got involved with before we started moving into the Russian Far East um, were in uh, we're in Siberia and Russia, um, and we worked with a remote sensing data, um, a data from a satellite sensor called, called Landsat, where each image was the size of one of these, what we call case study site footprints. So we established some case study sites. First of them were these three here in, in Siberia, and you can see they're all sort of at the southern end, the most productive part of the boreal for Russian boreal forest, where the trees grow the largest and the most, and the most dense. Most dense. Um, here's just a quick, each of these is one of those um, Landsat satellite images. This one's from Lake Baikal, around the area of Lake Baikal. They're 185 kilometers on a side, so you're not seeing the detail that we can see from remote sensing. Um, but if you zoom into them, there's a lot of detail. Uh, we can create maps of land cover by land cover categories, you know, different. Um, and then if we really zoom into them, one of those categories is forests that have been recently cut. So we call that logged. And if we look at remote sensing data over time, different images from different dates, we can follow the pattern of logging in an area, okay? So, um, by the way, these larger um, uh, cut areas were logged in the Soviet era, and these smaller little squares were logged in the post-Soviet area. So like um, Josh has said, um, things are not all, um, there's been actually a lot of um, scientific improvements in Russia as well. They've instituted um, smaller, um, uh, rules um, requiring smaller clear cuts. But another thing you can see on here, you can actually see the patterns of roads. Logging can be very road intensive. You have to build roads um, um, to, get, to get to logging. And so we started tracking, um, you know, where, where are the roads? And we eventually added more case study sites in the Russian Far East. And we found that um, th these little bar charts here, the blue shows the roads that existed by in 1975, and the colored bars show the roads that we mapped from remote sensing imagery that appeared after 1975. And what we found was that in 1975, the height of the Soviet era, there were more roads in our Siberia case study sites, um, the ones back here, um, and fewer in the, uh, somewhat um, fewer in the Russian Far East. So we got Siberia and the Russian Far East here. These are the two you want to look at. But that after the 1975, the greatest um, increases in roads were in the Ru Russian Far East. And what we also found was we looked at roads by the type of road, and we found the greatest increases in, were in what Russians call forest and winter roads. So we're thinking these are related to um, an increased logging um, in the Russian Far East, sort of the shift of, of, of um, intensive logging. 
There's still a lot going on in Siberia, but um, in defense of logging. Here's some roads overlaid on a map derived from one 185 kilometer by 185 kilometer area. Um, the colors aren't showing up very well, so I won't dwell on this, but what we can do is we can look at roads that, um, oh, here we go. That's why they're not showing up. I had a little animation. So these yellow roads are, and orange roads are newer roads um, compared to the gray roads which earlier existed. Um, so we were thinking, ah, interesting. Um, um, more intensive forest and winter roads being built in the Russian Far East in more recent years. Uh, we also looked at uh, rural population and what we found that unlike roads, where road building kept increasing um, after the um, demise of the former Soviet Union, in the case of rural urban populations, the area footprint of villages did absolutely not increase. Um, we know that, and, and we know from uh, population statistics that um, uh, populations decreased. So, um, uh, so that led us to, um, so th these findings of our past research led us to new questions uh, focusing on the Russian Far East as far as uh, factors underlying forest disturbance and land use change. And again, a couple of things that we had noticed is um, definitely more roads and more forest roads being uh, built in the, in the Russian Far East. <coughs> So we started to focus on this area here. Uh, we still had our case study sites, but what I'm going to talk about today is a study where we actually looked uh, at the entire area, very similar area to uh, Josh's uh, ma main areas that he works in, and um, uh, focus on this area. So our study area is this large administrative regions of Khabarovsk Krai and Primorsky Krai. And our questions are, how are individual natural and human factors, and I'll talk to you about what those are, influencing forest disturbances of logging and fire? Okay. Um, I'm going to move this to the other lapel. Okay. Um, and in turn, what land areas and what types of land areas will be most affected by logging and fire? So we wanted to start looking in detail, not just thinking of the Russian Far East as one sort of homogenous area, but are there certain kinds of landscapes that are more at risk of being logged or burned that we need to be aware of and um, um, uh, policy ma makers may need to know about? Okay. All right. Um, problems. There are really no integrated quantitative studies or models, um, statistical or otherwise, on the combined influence of human factors on land cover, land use change, including forest, fo uh, forest um, logging especially. There's some small number of papers um, about like where, where fires occur. Why do fires occur? Do they occur more in certain kinds of landscapes than others? There's some descriptive quantifications of past land use change. This is a really good book um, that came out pretty recently. But overall, um, researchers will agree that this is a fairly data poor region, especially as far as data access for Western, Western scientists. Um, uh, mostly, most primary statistical data is not available for in researchers. There have been some disincentives to, for collaboration and uh, incoming data are fragmented. Uh, that said, aside, there is a wealth of data on, f on forests um, held in Russia. Their forest inventories are some of the most comprehensive in the world, if we can get our hand, hands on them and work with our Russian colleagues to, to look at them. So this is our study site here, um, um, our study site here. And I'm going to go through these next few slides fairly, fairly quickly. I don't want to really get into the details of our methodology, but I want to give you a flavor, at least, of the kinds of things that we do. Um, these are maps of our study area, uh, Primorsky and the southern part of Khabarovsk Krai. Uh, these boundaries here are forest management units called Lesnichistva, and we had to map those and create those. Um, so we've been able to map um, uh, where urban areas and agricultural areas are, where areas that burn um, uh, more frequently, that's the red or less frequently. Um, we've been able to then map fire density by each of these forest management units. Um, uh, we've got a couple different years here. We've been able to map using the, we, we were able to actually get Russian forest inventory data. We were able to map actual forest harvest. This is the actual logging that's going on. And you can see our density maps or the darker colors are greater amounts of logging. Um, and we've also able to map what's called allowable harvest. So there's the actual amount of logging that's going on in the Russian landscape. And then there's what the government would actually allow if they had the resources to to really make it happen. And you can see it's, it's much higher, actually, than what's actually being harvested, which is a, 
uh, interesting and a cause for concern. And then um, what, so we were at, wanted to know what kind of both natural landscape related factors and human decision, um, behind the human decision making factors, um, cause some areas to be more, um, uh, more at risk for logging and fire, et cetera. So um, we had to create a lot of other spatial data. Um, um, here's our forest type. So different kinds of forests, spruce fir, larch, pine, hardwoods, et cetera. Um, people are familiar with that. But Russians also um, use what are called landscape types that are a combination of forest type and also the topography of the area. Um, so we have uh, taiga forests, but we also have mountain taiga forest, et cetera. Uh, grasslands, wetlands, et cetera. These are our forest management units, and they are either Lesnichestva, which are part of the Russian Forest Fund. They could uh, potentially be logged. Um, and with the dark blue within these are the least areas within Lesnichestva. So um, the blue areas are all part of the forest, uh, Russian Forest Funds. These are areas that are poten have potential for being logged, but the dark blue are areas that are now leased, something that uh, leases are new, um, what, beginning in the early 90s, right? Um, yeah. 93 or 94, et cetera. And, and some of these are leased to foreign companies. They're not all uh, uh, Russian companies as well. And then the green ones are protected areas with different levels of protection. These are like our national parks and that sort of thing. Um, we can map out the amount of mature forests, um, the um, amount of forest volume, so more mature forests, higher forest volume, might be more lucrative for, for logging. Um, we can map out uh, transportation density, okay? So, and within each of the forest management units, do they have greater or less transportation density? Roads and railroads are included here. Um, this is just something similar, um, the distance to the closest transportation, uh, some of them um, very low, some of them much higher. So these are the kind of things we, both the natural factors of, you know, where does logging occur? What landscapes are at most risk to being logged? Um, could be related to natural factors, um, human factors such as leases um, and transportation and other natural factors such as the, the quality, the density, the age of the forest. Um, so um, again, I'll, I'll go through these fairly quickly, mostly to give you a flavor and then I'll have some summary conclusions that we can, we can talk about. But um, we um, were able to combine our spatial data. So we work with these big spatial data sets. Um, we use geographic information systems um, uh, to do this. And we were able to, to say, for the areas, um, to ask questions, for example, for the areas that are leased versus, let's say, the areas that are in the dark green protected areas, do they have the same distribution of forest types within them? That might give us an idea of what, f of are there particular forest types that are more at risk of logging? Or, or conversely, are the protected areas that Russia have set up, are they protecting the, um, the sort of the distribution of forest types on the landscape, or are they uh, somewhat skewed? So here's the um, type of forest on the entire landscape. Um, these are, this is called mountain spruce fir, um, larch, um, this is um, non-forest, um, pine, et cetera, on the entire landscape. And here it is within the least areas. I'm just gonna point out a couple. And here in our fully protected areas, Okay, so you can see that the fully protected areas are not necessarily protecting the, the, the um, equivalent distribution of different forest types on the landscape. Okay, so um, and the least, and the le you can see that in the least areas, they're really interested in the spruce fir type, okay, um, for, for sure. Um, so just a couple findings from that, that kind of thing. We, I won't go through our, our statistics, I'm gonna just talk about our summaries here, but just to give you an idea of what's behind the kind of um, analysis that we do if you get into this kind of work. Um, we do try to quantify things so that we can help make this um, region a region that has, um, where we can actually point to statistics, some statistics and quantify it. But we did, uh, we looked at these sort of relative proportions and we found that least areas are less likely to be found in high mountain areas compared with pr protected areas, tend to be a little bit more skewed to high mountain areas. Fully protect, these fully protected areas have a less representative distribution of forest types and are for, found more in high mountain areas. We found many, a number of other uh, details, but those are some interesting summaries that we found from that, okay? Um, then we um, can do other uh, kinds of quantitative tests. So some of you probably uh, have a statistical background and have done things like Pearson correlations where we uh, see how correlated 
something is, is the uh, fire density within um, these different um, Les Nietzsche's to the land management units, these boundaries, are they correlated with things like um, the proportion of leased area within a forest management area, the uh, transportation density, okay? So we can kind of look at these relationships. So we did um, some Pearson correlations within the within the uh, Les Nietzsche, which is what's considered the forest fund. So anything that's not white areas, these white areas are mostly agriculture, they're outside of the forest fund. Um, and some of the things that we found were for actual harvest, this is what's actually logged. And by the way, this is only legal logging, okay? So we don't have a way to really detract the illegal logging at this point, but for actual legal logging, um, the, the amount of actual harvest is most strongly and positively correlated with the proportion of leased area within a list Nietzsche. I, I don't have the slide up here. So within each forest management unit, they, they, they're not, not, not necessarily leasing the whole, the whole thing. You know, some, only some parts of it are leased, but the more leased area, um, the more actual harvest. Allowable harvest, which is what could be logged, um, is a most positively correlated with the amount of forest volume. So the Russian scientists know where the biggest, richest forests are, and um, they've, they're allocating po the possible harvest to those with greater forest volume. Uh, fires within these forest management units, um, uh, in general, is positively correlated with rail transportation. In other words, higher transportation, higher fire density. Um, uh, I'll skip that one. A fire in leased areas. So we were able to look at just the leased areas, just the areas under forest leases, and found that recently some negative, um, they're somewhat negatively correlated with greater harvest activity. That was not necessarily something we expected to find. Um, so, um, and actually also somewhat negatively correlated with greater road and greater transportation density. It's a little bit uh, counterintuitive to us. We might find that the more that our people are in there working, doing logging, more roads, you might find more fire. And we do in protected areas. So fire in protected areas is strongly correlated, correlated with road dense, higher road density, greater transportation, road and rail um, density, okay, in protected areas. But at least it, it wasn't, it was somewhat negative correlated. Interesting, um, interesting finding there. Um, so um, again, not going through this, but for those of you who have statistical background, uh, we also try to actually cr create some sort of explanatory models where we combine a number of different variables and say uh, which variables are most important in, in predicting like where forests are going to be logged um, or, or um, where fire might occur in forests. And so uh, we have what we call dependent variables and we have independent variables and we just have a bunch of codes for these different factors that I've been talking to you about. And so. Um, we try to come up with some explanatory models. This is very hard to do in this kind of science because nature is so complex and it's not just nature itself, it's humans and they're sort of what they're doing, doing to nature. So um, more, more so than in you know, a lot of um, social science or really controlled experiments, we don't have a controlled experiment. We're dealing with a natural world out there and it's very challenging to build viable um, explanatory models, but um, but yet we, we do and we try to do that. So we try to, uh, we built some models based on combined um, human and natural factors um, to predict uh, what expl most explains actual and allowable uh, harvest in a forest management unit. And certainly, and it turns out the proportion least explains the most of actual harvest. Uh, the proportion of a certain type of landscape called mountain taiga forest explained the most of allowable forest. This is good, inf useful information to us. Um, um, lower latitudes explain the uh, most proportion of least area. Um, proportion of non-forest type actually explain the most burned area. Um, as it turns out, most fires in the Russian Far East actually occur in agricultural areas. These are not the ones that we're most concerned about, so future study for us to maybe focus more on those than just uh, forest areas. Um, so, and then we looked at the models um, based on just natural factors and human factors um, independently. Um, here is this mountain taiga forest. It's the kind of dark, dark green here. Okay, that's the mountain taiga forest in this landscape type. Okay, um, so um, some selected conclusions from, from our several different parts to our 
um, both remote sensing, GIS, and quantitative-based uh, focus study on here. Um, so leases, again, some are from international countries, have become an overwhelming influence. Okay? So leases didn't exist in the Soviet era. They're, they're a new thing. And these leases are clearly active. Uh, as far as legal logging goes, this is where things are happening. Okay? So that helps us constrain you know, where, uh, because we can map these. Um, our maps aren't real good yet. We, we don't have the official boundary information from the Russians, but we managed to put together approximations of them. Um, today, leases are a little bit more concentrated in the south. Um, we wonder, will they migrate further north, especially since there's a great um, uh, amount of the uh, mountain taiga forests um, for, further north, okay? So this will be something to keep an eye on. These landscape types, in addition to just forest species type, is really important. Russians have been very instrumental in these kind of integrated um, mapping of landscape types. Um, both these pluses here mean higher actual allowable harvest are correlated with higher forest volume, making this an apparent um, uh, important variable to map. So forest volume just means the, it's a combination of the size and the density of trees. Okay, so you can see that could be more lucrative to um, uh, companies. Uh, forest volume has both natural and human components. It's natural because uh, uh, just the trees themselves, but forest volume is reduced if an area has been previously logged. In leased areas, road and transportation seems to be somewhat less associated with fire, while in protected areas definitely associated with more fire. So that is, a, that is something that's actually a concern. We get more roads into protected areas. Um, we had some actual harvest models saying that they're somewhat negatively related to the pine forest type. We wonder if some regulations prohibiting logging of Korean pine are perhaps working. That's a long stretch to be able to prove something like that, but at least it lo lets us think about it. Um, for actual harvest, the actual amount of Russian landscapes that are logged, um, these human factors are the most important in the explanatory models. For the allowable forest, um, and human factors mostly being um, leased, but also transportation density, uh, the natural factors, forest volume, the amount of remaining mature forest, these, these um, including these forests that you called um, frontier. frontier forests, yeah, that haven't been disturbed much, um, 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 are the most important for allowable harvest. And allowable harvest is what could happen. It's legal to happen. It just, we just, they had just haven't been logging yet at those higher rates. So, um, so this allowable harvest, our statistical models tell us the future areas most likely to be harvested are mountain taiga forests, mountain mixed forest landscape types, and our spatial data tell us where these are. So this could be useful information. Um, again, as I said, the actual harvest, the actual logging going on in Far East landscapes is far less than the actual allowable harvest in what's called the Russian Forest Fund, which is the sum total of all of those Lesnichistva management units. And that was true for all Lesnichistva we man managed. So the future, and pretty soon I'm going to turn this back to Josh. Um, uh, it's my last slide, I think, one of my last slides. Russia has stated that it wants to increase lease terms from 50 to 100 years. So we've got the establishment of leases. We've shown that this is where logging is, gonna, is, is happening. And we've shown that the allowable harvest within these leases is still um, greater than what's actually being done. Um, and this is a quote, um, we have a huge amount of forests, but not enough accessible forests. Accessible forests, that comes back to roads and the idea of mapping roads and the fact that these have been increasing in the Russian Far East. It says, we need to construct more roads to go further into the forest. Once companies have forests leased for 100 years, it'll be easier for them to invest. So you can see, just in this statement, the importance of the whole idea of, of roads and leases and et cetera um, to what may happen in the future in these landscapes. And we hope from our statistical data that we have a little bit better uh, quantification and some scientific um, evidence of some areas that may be more or less um, at at, um, at, at either at risk or, um, or at least uh, more or less likely for this to, for this to happen. So um, that, like I said, that brings us back to where are the roads? So we know they've already been increasing in the Russian Far East more so than in some of the other areas. So this can be an area of um, additional further, further research. Uh, research. So um, many graduate students from CES worked on this, uh, thanks to all of them uh, with us, uh, my colleagues, uh, support by the NASA Land Use Land Cover Change Program. Um, and back to uh, Josh. Who yeah, we, we can, or we could just open it up for questions. Um, 
well, I don't have to leave yet. I've still got another f 15 minutes, so I, I kind of uh, went through things fairly quickly, so I think sure. you should go ahead and... Sure. Um, I just had but, one. But, but up to you. Sure. I so. one final slide. Uh, it's soft. Is that okay? No, I mean, you can go there. Yeah. Okay. So I just had one final slide. Um, I just, with a colleague from Bowdoin College, Laura Henry, we just wrote a review of sort of a reflection of sort of um, resource use and management, environmental protection in the Putin era, post-Soviet era. Um, and so some of the, uh, I just want to share one slide um, of that paper, because uh, I think it's relevant and related to what we're talking about today. Um, and really one of the main messages and um, or conclusions we came, came to was that there's a, a tremendous gulf between environmental laws on the books and actually enforcing them. And you see that a lot in, in resource areas in, in Russia, Russian resource regulation and use. Very much a sort of a selective application of the law, depending on the desire of the particular agency often. Um, it poses a lot of problems with respect to the timber industry because you have a very fragmented industry, as I was mentioning. You have um, a lot of road construction and other types of activities, and very uh, strong regulations, including logging on slopes and things like that, but very often very little interest in state agencies um, to enforce them, and often significant uh, components of corruption also in some of the enforcement agencies. And just to give you a sense of sort of how resource use and management has changed in the Soviet Union, this figure shows the devolution of environmental protection in the post-Soviet era, era. So the Ministry of Ecology was established in 1991, right, with the sort of the, in, the establishment of the Russian Federation. And then it was dissolved in 1996. And then it was renamed the State Committee on Ecology. So it was reduced from a ministry to a state committee. That was established in 1996 and then dissolved in 2000. And then um, in 2000, basically that sort of the environmental protection functions were rolled into the Ministry of Natural Resources um, in 2000. So basically a lot of the ecological kind of mo monitoring and management functions rolled into this resource agency, which is not only uh, now responsible for environmental protection, but also gives out the leases, also uh, is, is uh, allocating um, certain partitions to companies and actually runs the entire forest service. So many people compare this to sort of the chicken, the, the fox, you know, taking care of the chicken coop. So you have so often a conflict of interest, at least according to our analysis here. And that presents all kinds of problems for sustainability and resource use. Um, you've also seen, and probably a lot of you are aware, sort of the targeting of uh, selective journalists and NGOs as anti-Russian and rating of offices. A, a general persecution of civil society. Uh, that's another theme in, in the paper that we wrote. Uh, it seems to have lessened a little bit uh, in the last few years, but nonetheless, I think, is a, is a persistent problem. Um, on the other hand, we also, uh, through, the, through the Russian wood case, but also uh, if you track oil and gas uh, exports and other um, precious metals, diamonds from Sakha, you see, um, a, 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 a very much a global interconnection with Russian resources. And uh, that has had, I think, has increased awareness among Russian business in interests of the need for these, uh, some sort of uh, awareness of the demands of these consumer markets, right? And so I think that's having an effect, a positive effect, in terms of, of perhaps ratcheting up some sustainability principles and transparency measures with, with respect to tracking the origin of, of the resources, at least. Um, so we're seeing that, and that was one of the other conclusions. And also, I would say because we have these global markets, there's been an emergence of sort of international um, sort of NGO efforts to spotlight some of the problems with Russian resource use. So I don't know if any of you are familiar with the lumber liquidators case. Uh, which Environmental Investigation Agency basically documented that lumber liquidators was sourcing illegally logged Russian wood uh, and that was ending up supplying Chinese oak flooring manufacturing uh, in, in, in Northeast, Northeast China. Basically, um, this had a ripple effect. And so when I traveled through China and Russia for a Fulbright a few years ago, 
it was remarkable to hear both from the Chinese side, business side, but also the Russian business side, the effects that this, this uh, publication had. It had widespread, pretty widespread media attention internationally. That had a ripple effect on um, sort of uh, the production practices and the manufacturing practices in this particular supply chain. Um, they wouldn't even talk to me in China at these um, manufacturing facilities because they kept mentioning this report and they thought I was a spy for them and all of this. But they are clearly aware of some of the uh, challenges that are posed by you know, illegal logging in Russia, especially on the Chinese side. And in Russia, too, you see that increased awareness. So uh, you're seeing this kind of evolution of uh, um, not just um, you know, a state focus on sort of environmental protection, but sort of the emergence of a global transnational sort of awareness through things like NGO reports and just the fact that Russian resources are so interconnected now with other parts of the planet. So that was sort of the summary, and I thought that would be just a nice finishing to the pieces of work that we presented today. So maybe we could open up for questions. couple of questions. Thank you for both of your reports. Mm -hmm. The one question is, which country, or maybe there's no good answer, is the largest exporter of, or importer of these woods? Or does it go from one to the next, depending on? Depends the on the product. Okay. So the biggest uh, import, importer of Russian wood is China, by far. And then does the majority of that stay there? Does it's that thing come here? It's hard to track once it gets in country. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a rising demand. So if we take a specific species like oak and ash, um, a lot of that is exported, but there's a rising demand in China for oak flooring, for example. So you're seeing a rise of the domestic consumer market, which is changing the flow trajectory. But uh, still, mm -hmm. I would roughly estimate that more of it's going out of China than staying in China, mm -hmm. ultimately. Mm -hmm. So you have sort of enormous wood manufacturing facilities, especially in northeast China, but mm -hmm. also all along the coast now. Uh, and Russian wood is, is, is shipped down to Shanghai. It's tracked, uh, exported by train, especially uh, through, through Manchuria from Russia. Thanks. The mm -hmm. other question is about reforestation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there a pro program? to do this? There's not a widespread practice of natural reforestation in Russia. A lot of it, or of, of artificial reforestation. A lot of it's just natural reforestation. Mm -hmm. So no. There are some there, 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 there is some in, in some of the forest management units. Um, there is. There, Have you there, there is some, and it would be typical to, to what we would do if we clear cut an area. But it's not wide, widespread. Um, like, it just, like, the, like it is Like it is here, US. where you can sort of yeah. count on it being reforested. So have you done studies also on how long will these forests last without reforestation? Is this market going to dry up in 50 years? Or in, is there, have those you studies been done? That or um, no, I don't think we've tried to <laughs> tried, tried to quantify mm -hmm. that. Um, so so there not, is natural. Uh, I mean, you know, forests they, can they, regenerate they grow back. ash yeah. naturally if right. the soil isn't damaged, yeah. and yeah. it's it's t depends on the types yeah. of harvest practices a lot. Mm -hmm. So you can have situations where you have a selective forest regime, mm -hmm. selective logging forest regime, where you you know you log selective trees yeah. in a broader forest landscape, right. and those regenerate quite well. If you have a large, huge clear cuts. You can have the tendency for the soil to dry out. You can have the uh, fire regimes can come in and mm -hmm. burn repeatedly, which yeah. degrades soil and also um, doesn't allow seedlings to, to yeah. persist. Mm -hmm. So it really is very contingent on the type of t timber harvest practice. The, it, the, the forests in this area have been harvested for a long time. Yeah. I mean, in, um, you know, going back even to the early 1900s, okay. um, Pew. there have been large scale uh, logging. logging. Um, and, um, and it, it's not all clear cut, like you said, some yeah. of it's some of it's selective logging, especially further south in the Primorsky oh, southern region. It's, it's mountainous regions. In mountainous regions. So, um, and it's basically been just, there's been such a vast area of forest and the fact that the forest does, does grow back that they've been, but they have had a, uh, more or less in the Soviet era, had a pop, had a approach of let's log here and then go to the next air, you know, the next frontier area that hasn't been logged. 
and they still have that available. Um, the, the counter to you know, the fact that things do, do grow back is this is in the boreal area, and things grow back slower yeah. <laughs> than in other areas. So, um, so they've been just basically banking on the fact that it's such a large and vast, and vast area. Part of the so. reason I think you're seeing such an increase in roads is because they don't have enough accessible timber because yeah. they're probably not harvesting yeah. in a, sel a selective enough way. So they're perpetually punching in through new roads to access. Yeah. And it's often driven by the export market. So there's very strong demands in China for oak, for example, that's big, big, you know, export quality oak logs. You know, and that's yeah. old, those are old, 100, 150 year old logs, right? Yeah. So um, there's a demand for that. So you're seeing a lot of opportunistic mm -hmm. kind of road construction for that export market, which mm -hmm. is. We've seen on our remote sensing imagery some areas where we can actually tell that they're doing experiments with um, sustainable forestry and getting forests to grow back. And um, uh, these are kind of sporadic, kind of farther and few between, but we see that there are areas of that because um, we can actually see the different patterns. We, we kind of know what to look, look at. And the United States Forest Service has a, has a Russia forestry program. And in fact, one of our graduates, one of our joint graduates of Seas and Crease, who worked with me um, uh, when I first came here, Laura Peterson, um, she went to become the um, uh, base, well, first interim and then the acting director of the uh, 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 Russia program with the, with the Forest Service. She worked under a senior person for a while and then and spent a lot of time. So the, the U.S. and Russia uh, Forest Services actually have had some collaboration. For decades In, now. Um, yeah, for decades now. Um, yeah, so you know, there, there are some, some things happening. Other questions? Oh. I got about five minutes. I okay. Thanks. So I guess my question is related to the previous ones. You've and you've sort of alluded to this, but if the Russian government called you up today and said, "Okay, we want to do responsible forestry," <laughs> um, what are the practices? I mean, these forests seem so vulnerable to any logging in some way with their slow growth, mm -hmm. with this rising worldwide demand, what would be a pragmatic <laughs> solution? Can we take a couple to sure. to go? Just hear what a couple of the other ones are. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so really to um, illegal logging, I was curious how uh, that might be impacting certain forest types more than others. Mm -hmm. You've mentioned oak a few times, mm -hmm. and what the sort of profile of harvest types might be, how that might be different in mm -hmm. uh, illegal practices as compared to uh, leases. Yeah. Like they may be going in selectively, harvest, high grading. Um, yeah. Sure. And if you had any insights as to how that data might be captured, whether yeah. it's through like global forest watch data, which maybe gets patches better than selective harvest. Yeah or whether the legal inventory system might shed light on it. I'm sure. curious. I have the third one, and then... I think you have to leave. Thank you for a wonderful sure. presentation. So I have a question. First quick question is, uh, you use the free data from the Landsat, right? 30 by 30 meter resolution? Yes. And uh, the question will be, well, how much uh, did your f research findings uh, matched with the real data from the Les Niches organization? So 90%, 95%, or even more? In terms of the inventory? Yeah, uh -huh. the, the, your we, finding, yeah, research we, findings? Yeah, we can't map forest volume from, from this. So we're using the Landsat data just, sorry, I'm going to stick it. Jump in on this one, because I have to leave, and this is more re re sensing related. But these are complementary. Um, um, information sources. So we're not mapping forest volume from the, the Landsat data. We're using the Landsat data to, to, to map roads. And in fact, in the study that I showed you, uh, we did not use the Landsat data. Okay. Um, so in the, in the, uh, we, we used it in our previous study to, to map roads. But in the study I showed you where we're trying to find the relationships between th um, natural human that? factors and amounts of logging, et cetera, we relied on Russian forest inventory, um, from fire, we used um, the fire data products from a remote sensor called MODIS. Mm -hmm. So you're familiar with remote sensing, you'll yeah. know that. And um, the logging data was from the uh, Russian, for Russian forest inventory. Okay. So um, let's see. 
if I, there's anything else. Um, so, yeah. That's it. Great. So, um, I, I'm going to leave, but I wanted to mention one thing just related to the second question here and about selective logging. Um, we, um, we, in our case study site talk, uh, our work, which I really didn't talk about uh, for today for the Russian Far East, uh, we did try to map uh, clear cuts and and law and and um, clear cuts um, and um, uh, 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 in, in forests. And what we found out was that there were uh, very low numbers of clear cuts in the southern part, Primorsky Krai, where there's all those valuable hardwoods and, and Korean pines. Um, yet the amount logged was still relatively high. So by default, we had to assume that a lot of that's done being done by selective logging. Whereas in the more north, the, um, the north Sokota Lean and the more northern Kabarov, we found a lot of um, clear, mostly clear cut harvest. So we're not actually able to relate the numbers to each other, but we could relate the patterns uh, to each other. Um, and one last thing on the pattern is that uh, we did evaluate the patterns of logging, and this relates to what Josh was talking about, about the legal, um, actually carrying forth the legal protections. Um, in 1994, uh, there was a new forest code that basically said that clear-cut logging, which is the way most uh, logging, logging is done in Russia, um, had to be confined to fairly small patches that could only touch each other at corners, as opposed to really large-scale swaths of cutting down the forest. And we found in looking at our data that that's being adhered to a lot more in sort of the central Siberian sites, but in the Russian Far East, it was somewhat less adhered to. We think there's also challenges. It's a much more mountainous area. It's hard to do things in nice, confined little patches, but we tended to, we found it was a little bit, but it's also the Russian Far East, it's a little farther from control and that sort of thing. So um, a lot of other interesting things we did find. Um, I'm afraid I have to go and leave. I actually teach a class which normally starts at one. Um, but I really uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. I'll leave you in good hands with Josh for the rest of the. Sure. So maybe by addressing the illegal logging question first, I can also help and start the answer for yours. Um, so we can think about illegal logging on so many different levels. So you can be logging without a license at all, where you're going out at night and you're driving up a frozen river and you're harvesting, you know, a big, a couple big oak and ash logs. Um, we can also term, I think, illegal logging when you are logging under the guise of a sanitary logging license, which is really to harvest, like, dead, sick trees or trees that are a fire hazard and things like that. That's a widespread abuse, and it's been the primary loophole to get at really in high demand species like oak and ash in the s southern Russian Far East. So this is widely abused and widely issued by the Forest Service. Um, that we can consider illegal logging. There's also situations where you can have a legal concession and you're only allowed a certain amount and you're logging more of it or you're logging in a very concentrated area in a broader swath of a concession because there's species in demand. That's why I'm always going back to the export market and the consumer because that's driving the type of logging and the type of places that we're seeing. So um, there's lots of, lots of ways to, to, to uh, log illegally, I guess you'd say. I'd say by the time you get to the Russian border, things have been sort of legalized in, on paper because controls are actually quite strict, but you can, you can get the documents necessary often through various means to have that process become legal by the time it actually gets to the export point. Um, the reason that is relevant for your question is because, unfortunately, the, the, the flooding of illegal or suspiciously logged product is drive, driven down the price of wood coming out of Russia. So legal, legal entities are competing against illegally logged uh, wood. And so there's not enough of an incentive to log more sustainably because it's such a, such a competitive market on that sense. Um, so that's, I think, to get at this question, you have to deal with the illegality of first <laughs> to try to ratchet it up. Um, when in my conversations with lots of Russians over the years, that's you know one of the main hindrances to more sustainable logging. From a sheer volume export point of view, and also a resource value added point of view, uh, the Putin administration years ago put an export tax on logs to try to encourage value added processing in country. Um, that's proved complicated because 
Um, there isn't enough um, capital investment in many cases into value-added processing. So basically taking a log and making sawn wood even, right? You've seen improvements on that space, but very little furniture capacity, right? right really in the furniture production capacity in the Far East still. So that's another constraint. So if I could have a magic wand, that would be something else, maybe not through export ta taxes, but that certainly uh, uh, strategies to encourage value-added processing in country would help revenue and um, could also potentially slow down the amount of export of just the sheer raw material. You know, it's very much a, a log dependent economy still. So, although that's been changing in the last 15 years, it's still very much uh, logs. So. Thank you very much for the, um, very interesting presentation. Uh, my question is, um, you mentioned during your lecture about um, Putin era. Mm -hmm. How, um, but taking into consideration um, the news which came two days ago mm -hmm. from Russia about the presidency of Putin, that he, uh, that there, there will Another be term. new uh, changes to the constitution that yeah. will have the, he will have the possibility to go on with his presidency during the next 10 or 12 years. How, can, can you predict what impact on environment, environmental protect, protection of the natural resources of the forest can appear? I, I, I can't imagine it changing much from what it is now, you know. I just, I can't see without, you know, with the same status quo, I can't see things really changing. But with such a um, such such a centralization of power, I, I can't find it hard to believe that if the Putin administration really did want to stamp out Ill illegality, that it that it could, right? But I just don't see there's not the will there from what I can gather. So. Um, thanks for the presentation, Josh. Um, uh, I was wondering if you were. And Kathleen, we're thinking about um, coupling the two models a little bit closer. The <laughs> life cycle analysis, maybe. Supply chain, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. So actually putting those different kinds of um, harvesters in the model and seeing, you know, where are they going for their. Um, yeah, that's great. Um, we, we have, in fact, this concession data I, I, that I supplied is the basis for that Kathleen's working with is the basis for the, the, same, the same export flow tracking that I did. So we could, and we probably should, and we could identify the exact forest, um, at least in some cases. We have uh, the linkages I was able to make were limited to like three or four concession holders because we don't have data linking the harvester to the exporter. But if you're a big enough harvester, you're also often an exporter. So those are the cases that we're able to link. Unfortunately, we're probably linking the companies that we are better <laughs> in some cases than the, than the smaller companies, right? But because with this kind of transnational flow tracking, the weakness, the Achilles heel is always in-country flow movements because you don't have a, a border to, um, to, to contend with. And when you have a border con to contend with, it's amazing the amount of detail that they require um, down to the address of the company, you know, the, the, uh, all kinds of information. So, so yeah, we could, we could do it for less export. Um, I'm not sure if there's many others that would f f fill that criteria, though. And I'm thinking, like, if Kathleen can actually do the remote sensing, then she can maybe quantify or classify the kind of um, harvesting they're doing. And You'd have to use a way. different sensor, like Planet Earth or something like that. So for the avocado project I briefly mentioned and the oil palm, we're, we're doing the same thing, but we're actually we're mapping deforestation using really high resolution imagery, which is like one meter resolution uh, imagery. So it allows you to see, you know, individual trees in some cases. <laughs> so, yeah. Ooh, a silly question about mm -hmm. Of, of logging and deforestation on on the fa uh, the fauna and animals mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in in these patches Regions. and whether 
there's been it's a, not a silly question. Well, yeah. but I, I assume that everyone in the room knows the answer. So. Yeah. I don't know. Um, it's, it's difficult to quantify in some cases, but um, there's been lots of studies that have shown how the increase in roads is definitely detrimental to uh, fauna. And that's not only because of fragmentation of forests, it's that it provides access for poachers. The roads, pu you know, roads punched into wilderness will enable folks to, to, to poach all kinds of species. So that's one, in the southern Far East, that's one of the big impacts on, on the fauna. Otherwise, it's um, the common impacts like habitat fragmentation. So some large carnivores and mammals need large tracts of land often to, uh, for as, as hunting habitat. Um, the, the, uh, the eradication of the Korean pine tree in the southern Russian Far East, which was somewhat put to stop about 15 years ago with a presidential decree, uh, had a, a ripple effects on wildlife in that the pine nuts from the pine tree are the made food source for boars, wild boars, and tigers uh, love wild boars. So if you get rid of the pine trees, you affect the populations of boars, which then affects um, populations of larger, larger mammals. So, so have you also, is there like public discourse, you know, or public mobilization in Russia about the need to protect the forest? Or is the forest, because it's also in the Far East, you know, it's also a mythical place. There's so much of it. Yeah. You know, it's just like water here. We think, you know, there's so much of it. We're not that concern. It's seen as something that's unlimited, always mm -hmm. there. Uh, like and in the Poland, frontier. Uh, yeah, in, in Poland, there's a lot of mobilization yeah. against logging in the Białowieża. Sure. You know, it's become a political sure. issue. So I was wondering if there's anything of that kind in Russia I that's significant enough to be... I think it depends on the region, but certainly Primorsky Krai, where you have the Bikin River and you have the Tiger and you have um, a lot of uh, export-oriented, um, you know, activity with China and Japan that's definitely uh, in the discourse. And uh, the Amur Tiger is a source of regional pride, very much so. You go to Vladivostok and you go down and walk by the, by the Amursky Bay and there's a huge, you know, statue of the tiger. It's not Lenin, you know, there. So it's very much ingrained in that, in that region's identity and I think has helped stem the tide in terms of uh, opening up especially the Bikin River for extensive logging. Um, there's a lot of civil society action there still. Um, the, there's you know, been a lot of international focus on that region. Um, places like Eastern Siberia, Central Siberia, maybe not the same. There's maybe more a sense of endless bounty there. Um, but you know, the Southern Russian Far East is much, much smaller, less extensive. So like that, pr the Primorsky region. So. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, thank you very oh. much. Oh, is there one? <laughs> so um, you you talked about the oil palm. Yeah. It, it, I'd been wondering about the for the fire business. So we read about in Brazil how. Uh, rainforests are burned down to open up to agriculture, but presumably that's not the motivation in this area where in the Russian Far East. Yeah, um, we're not. Yeah. Wor I'm not working on oil palm in the Russian no, no, Far no, East. No, 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 no. Fire. No fire. It wouldn't be. So, you see so fire purposely. Is that accidental or it, as, as a most as of the fire fires are human it? induced, but they're not necessarily in the forest purposefully. Uh, they're not purposely lighting fire. You know. Um, they're often, they're, they're related to logging operations, sparks. They're people that use the roads to go party and start have bonfires and that spread. So most of it is human cause, but it's not necessarily purposeful. The one exception is in the agricultural, the wetland belt, um, the Lake Honk, like in the South Far East, the Lake Honka is a big, big kind of shallow lake that separate, that's on the border between Russia and China and you burn grass there um, it's for planting often. And that's this often a seasonal burn. A lot of the extreme southeast part of the Russian Far East, you see a lot of that. Sometimes that, that sparks out and, and 
hits hits forests as well, but most of that's controlled agricultural burn. That's really the primary pur purposeful burning that you see. So it's a bit of a different situation where you're burning a you know a very dense rainforest to plant soybeans or something like that or graze cattle. Thank you very sure. much, Josh, for being here with us.